On 30 September 1999, a nuclear radiation accident happened in Tokai, Ibaraki, Japan at the nuclear facility. This accident exposed 600 people to the radiation, and one of the technicians even underwent 83 days of unbearable pain in a hospital after he was exposed to the toxic radiation. Japan Nuclear Fuel Conversion, also known as JCO, is a nuclear company that processes uranium in order to produce fuel rods that can be used in nuclear reactors. Nuclear power is very important to Japan as the country is very poor in natural resources and they rely on imports for approximately 80% of its primary energy requirement. To show facts regarding this, nearly 90% of the crude oil that Japan uses came from the Middle East. In order to rely less on imported energy and the oil crisis that happened in 1973 and 1979, Japan developed its own technology by introducing nuclear energy. The nuclear industry serves well for the country as it provides 30% of Japan electricity and dependence on imported oil has dropped significantly. Furthermore, carbon dioxide emissions from nuclear power are lower than those from crude oil which make this industry environmentally friendly. Tokai was chosen as the location of JCO due to the available land space in that area and many others subsequently set up their factories there to conduct nuclear research. Nearly one third of Tokai population relies upon nuclear industry related employment and among them it included the three technicians who are the victims of the accident. On that fateful day, Hisashi Oichi, Masato Shinohara and their supervisor Yotaka Yokokawa performed their regular job as they converted uranium hexafluoride into enriched uranium oxide fuel. To enrich the uranium fuel, a specific chemical purification procedure is required. In this step, it involved feeding small batches of uranium oxide powder into a designated dissolving tank containing nitric acid to produce uranium nitrate. Next, the mixture is carefully transported to a specially crafted buffer tank that contains the combined ingredient. This tank is specially designed to prevent fission activity from reaching criticality where it will emit toxic doses of radiation that are fatal. Lastly, the mixture was then added in the precipitation tank with ammonia and this produced the enriched uranium oxide. However, the three technicians did not follow these tedious and time-consuming steps on that day, as the company was severely behind time to meet shipping requirements. They were pressurized by the higher-ups to make the uranium oxide as fast as possible to meet the deadline, and this got them to take shortcuts. The three technicians followed the company's illegal procedure, where they skipped several key steps in the enrichment procedure to hasten the production of uranium oxide. Instead of feeding uranium oxide powder into the designated dissolving tank, they decided to mix the powder with nitric acid in stainless steel buckets and pour it directly into the precipitation tank. This is a fatal mistake, as the designated dissolving tank is perfectly designed to prevent the uranium powder from reaching criticality, and skipping this step increases the risk of nuclear radiation happening. Nonetheless, Shinohara stood on the platform and was pouring the uranium nitrate solution into the precipitation tank while Oichi held a glass funnel with his right hand at the top of the tank. Yokokawa, the supervisor, was seated at the desk about 4 meters away from them. Shinohara and Oichi added 6 buckets to fill up the tank, which was very close to approaching the criticality level. At about 10.35 am, Shinohara poured the 7 bucket into the tank and they saw a blue flash. This caused the gamma radiation alarm to ring as a nuclear reaction had been triggered, which was why they saw a blue flash. The flash was also known as Cherenkov radiation, which happens when protons and electrons of an element travel faster than light in a clear medium like water and this emitted a blue light. This is a severe nuclear accident as the area is now bombarded with fatal doses of gamma radiation. The three technicians have now been exposed to the daily doses of the radiation and they immediately went to the decontamination room. Oichi and Shinohara experienced pain, nausea and difficulty breathing as both of them are the closest to the tank. In the room, Oichi vomited and lost consciousness shortly after as he received the most radiation. The three of them received a total of 30 sebo of radiation, where Oichi received a whopping 17 sebo as he was the closest, Shinohara came in second with 10 sebo, and Yokokawa only received 3 sebo as he was the furthest away. The limit radiation for occupational exposure is 0.05 sebo, which meant that all three men exceeded the limit. The three men were sent to the hospital immediately to seek medical treatment, 
as the gamma radiation alarm was ringing in the building, which prompted others to call the ambulance. Oichi was transported and treated at the University of Tokyo Hospital as they had better equipment and technology to deal with his condition. At the start, he actually looked fine after he woke up from his coma as he lost consciousness in a decontamination room. Oichi appeared to have minor skin irritation caused by sunburn, and a hand was swollen. The nurses even thought that he could survive and be discharged from the hospital soon. However, this doesn't make any sense as theoretically the dose that he received is supposed to be fatal, and he shouldn't look fine. The medical staff took a blood test on Oichi and was shocked to see the result. Oichi chromosomes were damaged by the radiation and it was impossible to arrange his chromosome. They were pretty much unrecognizable as the chromosomes were broken apart and fused to each other. The destruction of chromosome meant that his cells were destroyed and new cells would not be generated. Oichi's current condition of looking well is just temporary, as his body would progressively get worse. Oichi's white blood cells which acted as the defense mechanism of the body were dropping dramatically, and his cell count was only one tenth as compared to healthy people. This meant that a small cold could kill him as his immune system is very weak. Without a functioning immune system, Oichi was placed in a sterile ward as a hospital-acquired infection was more than enough to take his life. Dr. Mayakawa, the chief physician, and his team think of a way to save Oichi. They decided to perform peripheral blood stem cell transplantation, a new treatment at that point in time, and a revolutionary approach that has never been done on radiation patients before. The theory behind the blood stem cell transplantation is that the stem cell can produce white blood cell which can then help Oichi build up his immune system. To do this transplantation, they need someone whose white blood cell type matches Oichi. Finding the right person wasn't a struggle for them, as his sister was a perfect match for it. The medical staff immediately extracted blood stem cells from her sister's body and transplanted them to Oichi. The effectiveness of the transplantation will only be known to the medical team 10 days later, as the effect will take some time. After this procedure has been done, the radiation damage has become apparent on the surface of his body because his skin was ripping off slowly. This happened as his skin cells were dead and new cells were no longer generated. He also started to have breathing issues as he had developed fluid retention in his lung. The nurses wanted to put him on a respirator so that he could breathe better, but they couldn't bear to see Oichi being unable to speak to his wife. Oichi started to have difficulty speaking because his lung condition got worse. Despite this, Oichi was still putting on a brave face and was still smiling slightly when he had the chance to speak to his wife. The next day, Oichi became unable to breathe and the medical staff placed a breathing tube on him. His family visiting him was still hopeful and they were seen folding paper crane. As the Japanese believed that folding 1,000 paper cranes symbolized hope and good health, they wanted to put the paper crane in his ward, but since it is a sterilized room, the risk of infection was too big to do so. 10 days later, Oichi's blood was tested to see if her sister's stem cells were in his blood. Miraculously, her sister's stem cells were seen in his blood and Oichi's white blood cell increased as he went back to normal levels. This was the first time that such a transplantation worked in the treatment of radiation injuries. However, this recovery was short-lived as a week later, subtle mutations were observed in his red blood cell. The medical staff took a blood test on Oichi, which now contains his sister chromosome, and they observed that there were some abnormalities. The medical team presumed that the radiation was responsible for the damaged implanted chromosome, as the radiation damaged cells caused his body to attack the new chromosome. The aggravation of Oichi's condition wasn't limited to his blood and skin, and this time it spread to Oichi's intestine. Endoscopy revealed that the intestine mucosa, a protective membrane, had died and dropped down. The membrane served as a way of absorbing fluid and nutrients from food. And without this membrane, Oichi would experience fluid loss. Oichi then began to experience diarrhea as his body could not retain the fluid and nourishment from the food. Dr. Mayakawa's worst fear had happened as most radiation patients often died from digestive tract disorder and Oichi had begun to exhibit symptoms of it. Day by day, Oichi's diarrhea got worse and he produced 3 liters of diarrhea each day. 3 weeks after his explosive diarrhea, Oichi started to bleed. His intestine began to bleed as he oozed from the wound where the intestine membrane had fallen off. 
This meant that Oichi required blood transfusion as he was losing blood from his intestinal bleeding. Each blue tag on the document shows a record of one blood transfusion, and there were days when more than 10 transfusions were performed in half a day. This tells us how bad Oichi's condition was right now, and he was transferred to the ward for a critically ill patient. The bed was tilted to 55 degrees to improve systemic circulation and reduce pressure on his skin. However, this doesn't help his condition in any way. His blood and fluid were oozing from the area where his skin had fallen off, which got his entire body covered with gauze. Skin is the largest organ of the human body, and losing it meant that Oichi was now suffering from immense pain. Apart from his fluid lost in the digestive tract, he was also losing fluid from his skin. Oichi required large amount of fluid replenishment as he was losing 10 liters of fluid each day. To counter this problem, the medical team decided to do skin transplantation surgery to prevent the fluid loss. Skin transplantation was one of the latest treatment for burn injuries, and they decided to use it on Oichi as he was losing his skin. However, this surgery wasn't successful as the skin transplantation didn't stick to his body. This Oichi right arm one month after the accident, which showed that his skin had peeled and it was seeping fluid. At this point of time, the medical team didn't really know what to do because his condition just kept getting worse. Two months later, Oichi condition didn't get better as massive blood loss and repeated blood transfusion were still common. Since he was losing blood constantly from his intestine, Oichi heart was beating wildly to pump blood throughout the body. On one occasion, his heart rate was 120 beats per minute, which exceeded the normal resting heartbeat range of 60 to 100 beats per minute. 120 beats per minute is similar to running a marathon, and this is highly unacceptable for a bedridden patient. Oichi heart continued to beat so quickly to the point where it suddenly stopped. As there was no do not resuscitate order, the medical team performed CPR, and Oichi heart started beating again, but it stopped shortly after. This process repeated for three times and the medical team started to administer a cardiotonic drug in the hope of reviving the man, but it still didn't work. About an hour later, a miracle happened as Oichi had started to beat again. However, various organs like his brain, liver and kidney were damaged as there was no blood flow to those organs when his heart stopped. This caused him to be unresponsive as multiple organs of his body had shut down. Oichi now entirely depend on the medical equipment, which got the medical team to decide that this is the end of Oichi's life. Although the Oichi family still hasn't given up on him, a new condition emerged in Oichi's body which gave them another reason to give up. His immune cells started to destroy the remaining white blood cells that he had and within a short period of time, he had no white blood cells left which meant that a small common cold could kill him. Eventually, on the 81st night after the radiation accident, Dr. Mayakawa called Oichi's family members to convince them to sign the Do Not Resuscitate order. In the event that Oichi had stopped beating, the medical team will not perform CPR. His family agreed to his suggestion and signed the order. On the 83rd day, Oichi's wife and his son visited him, and the medical team removed the gauze from his face so that his family members could see him for the last time. Shortly after the visit, Oichi no longer suffered from any pain as he passed away on that night. Oichi colleague Shinohara, who was exposed to 10 sevo of radiation, suffered the same fate. He was transported to the same facility where he endured gruesome pain and underwent multiple treatments and surgery to treat his radiation injuries. Despite surviving for 7 months, Shinohara eventually succumbed to multiple organ failure due to the radiation exacerbated infection. 
As for Yoko Kawa, their supervisor did not die from the radiation as he received the least amount of doses. He sought treatment from the National Institute of Radiological Sciences in Chiba, Japan and he was released 3 months later with minor radiation sickness. However, he faced negligent charges in October 2000 as the police arrested 6 former executives and employees of JCO and Yoko Kawa was one of them. The investigation revealed that they had been using a stainless steel bucket to mix the uranium powder since 1993, which is clearly in violation of the rules set by the state organization. Yokokawa even had the audacity to claim he forgot that mixing so much uranium powder in a single batch can cause a nuclear reaction to happen. However, this doesn't save him from the crime as he eventually plead guilty to the charges of negligence resulting in the death of two technicians. Following this horrific accident, JCO credentials for operation were eventually taken away and they are the first Japanese plant operator to be punished by law for mishandling nuclear radiation. They continued to operate under a different company for over a decade until they automatically shut down during the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami and have not resumed operations since. Apart from the two brutal deaths, over 600 plant workers, firefighters, emergency personnel and local residents were exposed to the radiation. Authorities evacuated 160 people living within 350 meters of the factory and another 300,000 residents received a warning to stay indoors for 18 hours until the facility is free from radiation. Nearby agriculture and other service businesses were also affected by the radiation. To compensate them, JCO agreed to pay $121 million in compensation to settle claims from people exposed to radiation and affected businesses. Residents within 10 km of the incident were given free radiation testing, and there were 10,000 medical checkups being conducted over the span of the 10 days. Fortunately, none of them had major issues as they were too far away from the radiation. This gruesome case serves as a reminder that any act of negligence in a high-risk industry is a difference between a normal day at work and a fatal incident. 